Hi, Sean Munger here, That History Guy, and we're on number 10 of the Bond in Context series, where I'm talking about the historical context of the James Bond movies. In this video, we deal with one of the best-loved Bond films, The Spy Who Loved Me, which came out in 1977. Almost three years separate The Spy Who Loved Me from its predecessor, The Disappointing Man with the Golden Gun, from 1974. The Spy Who Loved Me is really the first reboot of the Bond franchise. Throughout the films of the early 70s, the producers and writers uh, of the films attempted various strategies to adapt Bond uh, to the radical cultural and social changes that accompanied the end of the 1960s, which was James Bond's kind of natural cultural territory, so to speak, if that concept makes any sense. In 1971, with Diamonds Are Forever, the producers tried outrageous camp and escapism, but it seemed to fall a bit flat. In 1973, Live and Let Die took the series in a different direction, especially imitating television. That didn't really work either. In 1974, Man with a Golden Gun tried to capitalize on the Kung Fu trend from East Asia, with extremely disappointing results. These are ad hoc attempts, just kind of throwing ideas out there to see if they would work. Uh, the Spy Who Loved Me, however, represents a concerted, the first concerted effort to find a unified tone for 1970s Bond. This was made possible because the Bond pictures were no longer serving two masters, so to speak. Since the beginning, the films had been produced by two people, Harry Saltzman and Albert Broccoli. By 1975, though, Saltzman had sold his interest in the franchise, leaving Broccoli alone the guiding force. As pre-production on The Spy Who Loved Me began, a Broccoli was legally prevented from reaching backwards into the well-used toy box of James Bond movie tropes. The character of Blofeld, the supervillain who had been Bond's nemesis in three films, uh, so far at least three films, and the organization of Spectre, uh, those were suddenly off limits. An Irish writer named Kevin McClory had claimed in court that he had come up with these ideas for the character of Blofeld and Spectre while co-writing the novel Thunderball with Ian Fleming in 1960. So to avoid infringing on McClory's intellectual property, Broccoli had to come up with something else. What they came up with, of course, was a very Blofeld-like character, uh, that being Stromberg, another megalomaniacal uh, supervillain with a plot to kidnap U.S., British, and Soviet nuclear submarines and use them to start a nuclear war. After the war, uh, Stromberg plans to reboot civilization uh, from his undersea base with himself naturally at its head. Uh, clever plan and almost exactly like the plot of You Only Live Twice, except using submarines instead of space capsules. Still, even if the story of The Spy Who Loved Me was a retread, the style was markedly new. In 1976, when the film entered production, the decade was starting to transition into what you might call peak 70s. With the oil crisis over, there was at least a little tiny bit of optimism in the air. Uh, the recessions that had plagued both the United States and Britain were uh, kind of ebbing and flowing, and they were easing a little bit in 1976. People were starting to have fun again. A new cultural craze was breaking open in the U.S., and that was disco. Uh, and this was, believe it or not, to have a pretty big effect on the Bond series, at least this film and the next film, Moonraker. Nightclub culture changed dramatically in the 1970s. Uh, in the early to uh, mid-60s, nightclubs were still places to hear live music. Frank Sinatra, the Rat Pack, that sort of thing. The late 60s and early 70s saw nightclub culture change primarily into a venue for sexual adventure, the hookup scene. This is incidentally how we got the casual dining chains of restaurants and bars like TGA Fridays, which sought to cash in on the hookup culture. Those, all of those chains got their start in the early 1970s. This kind of nightlife had its obvious drawbacks. Publicized by incidents like the January 1973 murder of schoolteacher Roseanne Quinn, who was killed by a man she picked up in a bar in Manhattan. This incident became the basis for the best-selling Judith Rossner novel, Looking for Mr. Goodbar, one of the uh, most popular novels of the 70s, which was um, adapted, itself adapted into a film, which came out in 1977, uh, a couple of months after The Spy Who Loved Me. 
Disco came out of the urban music scene in the late 60s, early 70s, but it really hit its stride in 1974 with the release of several big hits, including Rock the Boat uh, by the Hughes Corporation, a hit mix record uh, recorded by Gloria Gaynor, and particularly the Swedish band ABBA, who won the Eurovision 1974 Song Contest with Waterloo. Disco successfully changed the narrative of nightclub culture from sleazy sex to fun, energetic dancing and wild clothes, flamboyant clothes. Of course, uh, however, the subcurrents of sex and drugs would be an important part of the disco culture until its demise about 1980. The Spy Who Loved Me heavily involves disco. Instead of using John Barry, the traditional, com traditional composer for the Bond series, uh, he was unavailable due to an income tax dispute. The producers turned to Marvin Hamlish, uh, who is a veteran stage and screen composer, and he composed a very disco-heavy score for the film. Although the theme song for The Spy Who Loved Me, Nobody Does It Better, very memorable song, that's not a disco song, but much of the rest of the movie's uh, musical score has a very strong disco flavor. Take, for example, the song, uh, the theme played in many of the action, action sequences, uh, which is called Bond 77, which you can literally dance to. The Spy Who Loved Me seemed to channel the disco era in other ways, too. Take the groovy costumes, for example, full of polyester and bright colors, which wouldn't look out of place on a dance floor in an upscale club. The visual look of the film is very slick and shiny, evoking kind of a disco ball type of vibe. It's hard to imagine Roger Moore boogieing on the dance floor the way that John Travolta does in the iconic Saturday Night Fever, which also came out in 1977, but the film stops just short of that. Remember I said there was a little bit of optimism uh, in the air about this time. This coincided with changes in political leadership uh, in the United States and in Britain. In March 1976, British Prime Minister Harold Wilson announced his surprise resignation from office. Uh, there was not a general election, but instead a leadership election within the Labour Party, and James Callaghan replaced uh, Wilson as Prime Minister. Callaghan took office at a time of inflation and unemployment, but there was a sense, at least for a while, that he was going to start using the machinery of government to try to address these problems. And indeed, Britain was showing signs of economic recovery uh, by 1977 and 1978. In the United States, President Gerald Ford narrowly lost the 1976 election to Jimmy Carter, former governor of Georgia, who took office in a widespread but short-lived moment of optimism. Uh, Carter, who promised the American people that he would never lie to them, seemed like he was going to change government after the corruption of the Vietnam and Watergate years. When Jimmy and Rosalind Carter walked to the inauguration instead of riding in a limousine, this was a highly symbolic moment that seemed to promise a new way of doing things in Washington. Carter's honeymoon with the public, however, didn't last very long. By the end of 1977, he was mired in a number of problems, in, um, especially involving Congress, with whom he never was able to work effectively. But still, summer 1977, when The Spy Who Loved Me came out, this was probably the least depressing moment of the 1970s, for whatever that's worth. The Spy Who Loved Me is a fun, lighthearted adventure film. It has dazzling visuals, memorable villains, great music, and probably Roger Moore's best performance as James Bond. People were having fun at the movies again. In the United States, the biggest box office draws that year included the car chase picture, Smokey and the Bandit, and of course, the biggest film of all time up until then, George Lucas's Star Wars. Indeed, Star Wars would also have a huge effect on the Bond series. Star Wars came out on May 25th, 1977, and took the world by storm. No film had ever grossed so much so fast. Star Wars, in fact, was at its peak when The Spy Who Loved Me premiered on July 7th, 1977. It's amazing that with Luke and Han Solo sucking all the oxygen out of the film market that summer, The Spy Who Loved Me managed to do as well as it did, grossing $185 million worldwide. The film marks a major triumph of the franchise. Had The Spy Who Loved Me been a critical or a financial disappointment, I'm almost certain that the series would have ended right then and there. This film, however, saved the Bond series. In the next video, I'll discuss the very different film that closed the 70s, Moonraker. Thanks for watching.